Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, I was, as I said, I was going to do, uh, I told you this in the last video, we were going to do the alignment of the meters and rebuild the board. Well, I did rebuild the meter board, but unfortunately these meters are pretty bad. Uh, the little jewel adjustment screws, you know, for the pivot, uh, the enamel has been broken on them, meaning people have been kind of twisting on them, trying to adjust them and they appear to be ruined and I really was not able to get them set to work smoothly anymore so these meter, these meters are going to need to be replaced so I think I, ha I have found a set that I'm gonna be able to fit in there we'll have to see but until then we're just gonna leave it alone so what we're gonna do and I'm kind of excited about this in this video is we're going to look at the specs of this amplifier and then we are going to test it and we're going to do some pretty uh, involved testing on this using the oscilloscope and some other uh, test equipment and uh, hopefully this amp will perform as indicated let's get started where did this come from ah, this must be one of those audio files Great. Now nothing that I say or do in this video is going to be right. <sighs> While we're at it, I just want you to know some of the wire that I'll be using in this video will have oxygen in it. And they're not burned in, but some of the wires I have on this bench are burned out. And they're twisted. And everything is wrong. So I'm just forewarning of those of you who... <laughs> All right, enough of that. Now let's check some of the technical specs of this amp. I'll just hold this paper up here, and you can see um, this amplifier is rated. Uh, it's 4 ohm stable. It can do up to 150 watts per channel into 4 ohms, 125 a channel into 8 ohms, and so forth. And it says both channels driven rated at rated distortion 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So that's that a pretty tall order for this amp. THD should be less than 0.1%. So that's pretty high for modern standards. But for this era of amplifier, that's pretty good. I mean, you figure 125 watts into 8 ohms at 0.1% distortion, not bad. Uh, intermodulation distortion. I don't know if we'll get into that test today. We may, but uh, not sure if I want to set that all up. Frequency response is supposed to not vary more than 1.5 dB between 2 Hz and 100 kHz. And that's pretty good, so we will test that for sure. Um, the input sensitivity it says you should be able to put in 1.5 volts of, to get rated power output. That's going to give us a gain of about 21, so, roughly. So somewhere between 20 and 21. So we'll check that. Um, damping factor, I don't know if I'll get into that one today. We'll see. It's really kind of a moot point if everything else falls into place here. So let's look at some of these things, and to make it a little easier this time, because I always forget things, I made up this little sheet, <clears throat> and we're going to follow this. And again, this is not straight out of the manual. Some of this is stuff that they tell you to test in the service manual. Some of it is not, so some of it's pretty standard. That's what most of this is going to be at the beginning. So the first thing we want to do is just our gain test. And to do that, I'm going to set my signal generator for 1 kilohertz. And we're going to adjust the signal to get 10 volts RMS at our dummy load, which is going to be 8 ohms, both channels driven. And that's going to give us about 12.5 watts. So let's do that. So here's our signal generator. I have 1 kilohertz and... We're going to be right around 400 millivolts. We'll see if that gives us what we want. And uh, we're going to shoot for 10 volts RMS at the output that's going into our dummy load. And 
just for your information, we have our 8 ohm dummy load connected right now. So we're going into our uh, speakers. And I do have it set to times 1 because this times 10 is going to interfere with our sensitive test equipment. It will actually load that down because of the impedance. So we're going to use a times 10 probe on our scope. And uh, maybe we'll get a little more into that later. I'm not sure, but uh, that's what we're going to do so it doesn't interfere with anything. Okay, let's turn the signal generator on. And if you look, I can't touch the screen because it's a touch sensitive screen, <laughs> but we have about 10 volts on both channels. So there's our 12.5 watts. And what we want to do is we want to record the signal level at the input to get that 10 volts. So let's take a look at that. So our signal generator is outputting 489 millivolts RMS in order to get that 10 volts RMS out to the speaker. So let's write that down. Okay, 489 millivolts. So it's 0.489 volts. And then it says your gain is going to be your RMS out divided by your RMS in. So we had 10 volts output divided by 0.489 volts in gives us a gain of 20.4. So that's 20.4. And looking at our spec sheet, we should have about 21. If you do the math, 1.5 volts to get the maximum output. So yeah, the amp is performing within spec on that. Okay, now we are going to set the signal generator for 20 hertz or the lowest obtainable frequency. And we're going to not change any of the settings of the signal generator as far as the voltages are concerned. And in a perfect world, we should still get 10 volts of output, RMS. So let's take a look and see. Okay, let's go to frequency, 20 hertz. And of course, we have to adjust our scope for that. And take a look at that, 9.98 volts. Okay. So it's 9.98. Almost right on 10 volts, huh? Okay, the next thing we want to do is adjust for 20 kilohertz. So let's do that, 20 kilohertz. And once again, let's move our meter. And we once again have about 9.98. Perfect. You see where I'm reading that right here? And both channels are doing it. They're actually falling right on top of one another. So channel two, see it? And there's channel one. They're both doing the same thing. So the channels are perfectly, perfectly matched and balanced. Okay, now Marantz has you do a similar test, only they do their middle frequency is 2 kilohertz instead of 1. So they're doing 20, 2 kilohertz, and 20 kilohertz, that's all. But anyway, this thing is pretty linear. Now this is a similar test to what we do when we do the frequency analysis uh, on the GW Instech. You've seen me do that on other videos um, where I use the frequency analysis program on that. It's doing the same thing, it's just plotting a lot more uh, places and it's also measuring the uh, phase shift from input to output. But uh, this is a quick and dirty version of that test and it can give you almost as good of information as, as that more complicated test. Alright, so now we're going to do our min and max power tests. Now a lot of times people get really 
into this, you know, how much your maximum wattage is, and that's all they care about. But truly, you don't listen to these amplifiers at their maximum power most of the time. As a matter of fact, you don't listen to them at even a tiny little bit of their power. Uh, most listening is done, you know, below a couple of watts. So to me, it's just as important to look at the performance of the amplifier at low power as it is to look at it at high power. And one of the things is if your bias and DC offset are not properly adjusted, it can affect the performance of the amplifier at low vol volumes a lot more than it will affect it at high volume. So it's important to check low volume <clears throat> and make sure you're not getting any little crossover distortion or something that could affect the sound at low levels. Okay, I now have the amplifier set to just put out 100 millivolts. And if you do the math on that, that's only one milliwatt <laughs> of output power to the speakers. So that's extremely low power. But we want to see that because if there's going to be any crossover distortion from our bias being set incorrectly or something, you're going to see that right in here. Now, all that noise, disregard that because we're using some times 10 probes and that's a high impedance input to the scope. And because of that, you're going to pick up a lot of noise. But what we do not see is any of that crossover or notch distortion. So that tells us we're going to get a very nice, clean sound, even at low volume levels. And I'm driving this with only 5 millivolts of input signal from the signal generator. So it's very tiny. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look for our maximum power output before clipping. Okay, so let's take a look at that. And that's a pretty high. Right about there is clipping. There it's just gone away. And we're getting 33 point, about 33 volts RMS. So let's record that down here. Okay, there's our 33 volts. And if we do the math, 33 squared divided by 8, 136 watts. Wow. And if you were looking at the oscilloscope, you saw those the, the little kind of brown and blue colored lines. And you can see each graticule. Well, I'll show it to you real quickly. Each graticule there represents 20 watts. So 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140. And you can see just under 140 watts. Okay, the next thing we want to do is we want to measure our THD, or total harmonic distortion. And again, we're going to do this at 1 kilohertz. I did not, uh, we're going to start at 1 kilohertz. And we're going to check that. So the first thing we want to do is we want to put kind of just low power out, simulating what it would be like uh, listening it in a quiet room at not real high power. So let's do that first. Okay, I've changed the scale of our watt meter to one watt per division. You can see it down there. And so we're at one division, which is one watt, and you can see both channels falling perfectly on top of one another. And you can see two, about 2.86 volts. You can do the math if you want. And if we look over at the THD meter, it's bouncing right around between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02% THD. So we'll say 0 0.02. We'll just write that down. All right. Very good. Okay. We've now set the amplifier to 50% power. I've changed the scale again back to 20 watts per division. So it's 20, 40, 60 watts. So that's half of the 120. 
and THD gets even better. So excellent. And part of that was our test equipment because you have to figure all of the uh, cables and things where there's some losses. So this is pretty accurate. So it's point zero one one six we'll call it. So point oh one six percent THD. And that is excellent. Okay, we're now right up at our 120 watts. And look at that. 0 0.014. Excellent. Okay, let's take a stop here and feel the heat sinks. They're getting warm. They feel very, very similar in heat, both channels. And I can hold my hand on it all day long. They're warm. I mean, you can feel the warmth, but they're not burning up. And you see how hard we've been driving this amp. So, so far, I'm loving this amp. Okay, the next test that we're going to do is going to be 20 hertz at max power. So all we're doing is we're just going to go from 1 kilohertz down to 20. We, I have reset the scope scale so that we can display that. There it is. So far, so good. It looks good. And look at that. Bouncing around between 0.1 and 0.2. So we'll just call that 0 0.02. All right. Now we're going to move up to 20 kilohertz. Okay, we've reset the scope. There's our 20 kilohertz. And 0 0.038 THD. So it's gone up a little tiny bit. Well, we certainly can't complain about these numbers yet, can we? All right. So the last we're going to do is we're going to repeat those two tests at 50% power. So we're going to leave it at 20 kilohertz as you can see, and we're going to go down to 50% power, so we're just going to go down to our 60 watts once again. Okay, and we're just a little bit above 60 watts, but we're roughly halfway. And we can see our power, our uh, THD is about the same. It was 0.038, it's now 0 0.04. Okay, we're now at 20 hertz at half power, about 60 watts, give or take. And, again, right around 0.02% THD. So there's so far how our amplifier is running. So we know that it can definitely meet all of its specifications. So the next thing we're going to do, and this is our last part of the test, is we're going to do what's called a stability test. And we're going to see how this amp performs uh, with a little bit of minor <laughs> reactive load. And uh, we're going to see what happens when we put a, a square wave signal through it instead of a sine wave. So as you can see, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to set my amplifier to about 50% power, so there are 60 watts again. And we're going to inspect the waveform for any kind of ringing or oscillation. So let me set the scope up for that. Now a square wave can be notoriously hard <laughs> on an amplifier, especially amplifiers that have reactive components to them in the first place. So this is what will throw a lot of these older style amplifiers into oscillation, if anything's going to do it. This and the next couple tests will kind of tell us uh, what we're going to be in for here with this. So let's take a look. Okay, so there's your power, and let me just increase this a little so we can look a little better at this. And you can see there's a tiny little bit of rounding there, but there is no oscillation or anything. This is a very, very clean looking waveform. And I can tell you, if anything will throw a lot of heat into the heat sinks, it is that test right there where you're putting a good bit of power out and driving it at a square wave. 
and these are still these heat sinks are still not that hot so this thing's surprisingly working very well so I would call that a pass so let's mark our little sheet just like so all right we're now going to set the max the amplifier to max power and this is very ugly <laughs> on these amps but I think this amps up to the task so let's do it okay here we go max power and it looks pretty darn good I don't want to leave that on for too long because that'll really heat the amp up but you can see it didn't seem to have any problems and there was no oscillation so we'll call that one a pass next thing we want to do is we want to take a 0.47 microfarad film capacitor and we want to put it right across the speaker output and we want to look and I'm going to check each channel this way. I'm going to put this load across both of them because we want to make sure that uh, this neither of these channels is going to go crazy when it sees that. So I will do max power and I will do half power and we'll start with the half power. Okay, here's our capacitor and you can see it's going over to the speaker terminals. And we're going to zoom way in so we can really, really see this waveform. Because we want to see what it does. Alright. And hopefully it won't blow up. <laughs> Alright. And you can see the little bit of ring and see how quickly it extinguishes it? That's what you want to see right there. See how fast? Now let's move over to the other channel and make it do the same thing. Okay. Identical. Excellent. Okay. Now we're going to run this at max power and do the same test. And if something's going to go wrong, I would say it'll go wrong right here. All right, here we go. And you can see on the fall time, it's a little bit more. And I don't want to leave that on for a long time, just mainly because of the square wave. But you can see it controls itself. And let's go into channel one. Identical. Okay. Okay, I'm going to call that a pass. Now, the next one is kind of unique. I wrote it in this, this sheet. This is unique to this amplifier. They want you to put a 4 hertz sine wave and increase the output until your protect relay trips. And it should trip somewhere between 15 and 32 volts RMS. So let's do that. Okay, we have our 4 hertz waveform going in there and right now we have approximately 11.6 volts RMS and it says somewhere between 15 and 32 volts it should trip that relay and we should hear it click so I'm going to hold the microphone close to the uh, protect relay and let's turn up the amplitude oh. would help if I turned up the amplitude and not the frequency here we go. Let's try this again. There it goes. Okay, so let's do that again. We're at 15.5 volts. Right there's where it clicks. So right around 17 volts. Did you hear that flickering back and forth? So right around 17 volts RMS. And it said somewhere between the 15 and the 32. So I'll call that a pass. So we'll say 17. Okay. And we have recorded it on our sheet. Okay, the next test is putting the dummy loaded to 8 ohms, 200 hertz, and drive 22 volts RMS into the dummy load. And then they want you to dead short the channel with an amp meter 
verifying that the reading does not exceed 9.5 amps. And I can tell you, this is a very dangerous test. It's not something I really want to do. And even if it did uh, hang around that, it wouldn't take long for something to really go bad. <laughs> and I don't want to damage the output transistors. So I'm going to skip that test. Uh, again, uh, that does not you can still overdrive this amplifier even though it has the overcurrent protection circuit um, because you're just driving maximum power directly into a dead short so not something I want to do last but not least let's do our slew rate test we'll talk a little bit about what that is and why it's important okay the last thing we're going to talk about is slew rate and slew rate is, is a, an important factor to know about if we're wondering what the maximum frequency we can get at full power. And why do I say at full power? Well, it'll all be clear here in a minute. Clear as mud. <laughs> so what, what we're doing is we're measuring how long it takes the amplifier to respond to a change in voltage level at the input and, in, and at the output. So if I go to the input term, so you have your amplifier, you have your input source, and then you have your output, which goes to your speakers, right? Just like so. And if I suddenly put a square wave in there, for instance, like a very quick change, a square wave should give us an instantaneous change to that voltage. So if I go from 0 volts to, let's say, 10 volts, it should be instantaneous. But of course, in the real world, it isn't. There's always a little bit of a delay. And that delay, even though we put an instant change at the input, what we're going to get at the output is something more like this. It's going to be, and I'm, I'm exaggerating it, like that. So it doesn't come out totally straight like that. And the rate at which this changes is what we refer to as the slew rate. And slew rate is measured, our standard measurement, in how many volts of change can, can occur within one microsecond. So slew rate is volts per microsecond. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to calculate that. First, we're going to measure the output when we put an input in there, and then we're going to calculate it. Now, of course, even the input isn't a perfect square wave. So the rise time on my DG4162 oscilloscope is pretty darn fast uh, when compared to what this amplifier can do, and it, it's faster than any audio amplifier although it is not faster than some uh, op amps that are out there and so forth, some of the high-end ones. And I do have pulse genera a pulse generator that even has a faster rise time, but we don't need to get into that right now. So what we want to do is measure this. Now in order to do it, we have to know a couple things. First of all, we have to know what's the maximum voltage that this amplifier is going to put out. And we can calculate that. And then we have to know what the rise time is from zero to that maximum voltage. And with those two pieces of information, we can calculate it. Now, first things first. To find this voltage, we can look at the maximum power of the amplifier. So in this amp, for instance, is 100, let's say it's 125 watts per channel. 125 watts per channel into an 8 ohm load would be 31.62 volts RMS into an 8 ohm load. Now, to calculate slew rate, though, we need to know not the RMS voltage, but the actual peak voltage. So we take that RMS we times it by 1.414 and we get 44.7 volts peak or 
89.4 volts peak to peak, which would be the entire waveform. So this would be for half of the waveform. This would be for the entire waveform. Okay, so half cycle, full cycle. And we can use, you're going to find out that in most cases we can use either one. It'll give us the same result. Okay. Now, if you haven't already figured this out, this slew rate is going to control the highest frequency that this amplifier can faithfully reproduce. Because think about it. If we have this little delay here, what is a sine wave but a slope? So this has a certain slope angle to it here. And the fall time has a certain slope angle to it here. And if the rise time if, of the amplifier is slower than this particular frequency, it's going to distort the waveform, right? Because it can't, it can't reproduce that waveform because it can't change fast enough. So the maximum frequency that an amplifier can faithfully reproduce is controlled by that rise time or that slew rate. So the math formula that shows that is slew rate equals 2 pi times the frequency times your volts, either volt peak or volt peak to peak. So for the whole signal, we would say 2 pi frequency times the voltage peak to peak. And for a half cycle, it would be slew rate equals 2 pi times the frequency volts peak. All right, and they're both pretty much you can use this one to figure this one out. Just depending what kind of test equipment you're using and how you're measuring it. So, for instance, we know that our ears can hear up to 20 kilohertz. And I know some of you guys can hear way above that. Uh, <laughs> but... For all intents and purposes, let's say our, our the range of hearing is 20 kilohertz. And if we want to reproduce 20 kilohertz at 125 watts per channel into an 8 ohm load, then that means we need to reproduce 20 kilohertz at 31.62 volts RMS or 44.7 volts peak or the 89.4 volts peak to peak, right? So let's use that formula here. If we take 2 pi times 20 kilohertz times your 89.4 volts peak, which would be, you know, from the bottom, all the, you know, from the negative peak to the positive peak, we come up with this great big huge number, which was 11,234,335, and that's in volts per second. Now we know there's a million milliseconds in one second. So we divide by a million and that's going to give us 11.2 volts per microsecond. So if we don't have a slew rate of at least 11.2 volts per microsecond peak to peak, then we cannot re properly reproduce a 20 kilohertz sine wave. So that should give us an idea of where we need to be. Now, if you just measure the, just the half cycle, okay, from your zero crossing to your half cycle, you can do the same formula just using V peak, which is half of peak to peak, and you'll come out with exactly half of this. So you could do this and then double it, and that would be your actual slew rate that you need. Hope that makes sense. So let's test that out on our real amplifier and see what it comes out to. Hopefully it'll be better than this. Now remember the frequency response according to the technical specs for this amplifier is up to 100 kilohertz. So let's do our little math formula. Okay for 100 kilohertz we want to do 2 pi times 100 kilohertz times we want to do our full 
volts. And that's going to equal, we'll do the math real quick, pi times 2 times 100,000 times 89.4. And if you look, you get this great big number, but if we divide it by a million, you're going to find out that that's 56.17 volts. For, so it's 56.17 volts per microsecond. It's pretty high, isn't it? So let's see what we get. Okay, we're going to capture a quick waveform on here. We have one kilohertz, we're running about maximum power into this, and we're just going to capture it, and then we're going to stop it. Okay, as I bump the camera. So now if we look at this, let's look at a couple things. First of all, we're looking at just under 30 volts, so it's a little bit below your maximum power, but very very close and what we want to do is we want to measure the rise time now rise time as you can see I already have a calculation for it in here but we're gonna look at something else here and let's take a look okay I've turned on the cursors and I measured from the very bottom of the waveform just after it starts curving up right around that five or ten percent mark and then all the way just till it's ready to flatten out getting up to about that ninety percent of the voltage there and you can see right there we have somewhere around 1.9 microseconds is what we're measuring see one right there and if you look at what the machine calculated, it says 1.86. So you can see the built-in rise time calculator is very, very accurate. All right. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to switch our cursors. And we want to change it to the horizontal bars. And we want to measure that same thing. And if you look our change is right around 50 volts. Your delta V is around 50 volts. Okay, so we need to write that down. 1.9 microseconds for a 50 volt change. Now to find our slew rate, we just simply divide 50 by 1.9. And if we do that, you see the slew rate we're getting is about 26.3 volts per microsecond. Now, for 100 kilohertz, they're saying we need closer to 56 volts per microsecond if you remember from our calculation. So let's see what frequency this 26.3 volts per microsecond gives us. If we rework the formula, slew rate, which has to be, for this formula, has to be in volts per second, because of course frequency is per second, <laughs> cycles per second, divided by 2 pi times volts peak to peak again. So we know our volts peak to peak from down here is 50. We know our slew rate is 26.3 per microsecond, which would be 26.3 million volts per second and divide that by 2 pi times that voltage, which is 50, it's going to come out to 83,704 hertz, or 83.7 kilohertz. So we're just a little shy of that 100 kilohertz, but we're pretty close. And I think what you'll find is that 
some of that discrepancy we're going to see there is some of the test equipment and the measurement points that we chose to measure it. It is entirely possible that uh, you know they when they measured it on their bench they had a little bit different points that they measured it on the scope. But I would say we're pretty close to spec on this. So let's see if we can get an 83 kilohertz sine wave to be undistorted. Okay, I'm not going to leave this on at really high power for long because it draws a lot of current and it will cause the fuse to open up. And you can see the fuse didn't obliterate, it just barely opened. But I'll show you, we have 83 kilohertz on there. And I will go ahead and capture it. And as you can see, at 25.6 volts uh, RMS, we have, what do we have? 86, or what is it, 83 kilohertz. And there you have it. So essentially what this proves is that the amplifier is capable of reproducing a frequency four times uh, the maximum frequency we can hear. So this amp should sound amazing. <laughs> uh, we tested it every way we can. Uh, again, there's a few other things we could test, but um, I think you all get the point. Let's put the covers on and see what it looks like all put together and then play some music through it. Okay, we are all set up. Here's our amplifier. Here's our preamp. Yes, I am crossing the streams. I am driving a Marantz amplifier with a Pioneer preamplifier. I am committing every cardinal sin that we can. I have oxygen in my wires. I'm blowing more oxygen in them. And they're twisted around. <laughs> I got everything wrong. And I'm using MP3s that are compressed that I downloaded from the YouTube library. And I'm going to play a cheesy knockoff Cool in the Gang sounding like song from YouTube. So here we go. Let's see how this thing works. And just to make matters worse, I recorded this with my lavalier mic. <laughs> and I'm going to play it back through YouTube so that you can all say, well, that doesn't say anything. It doesn't tell us how the amp really sounds. We're listening to a recording on YouTube. Yep, you are. But I can assure you that I'm hearing it and it sounds really good in all, all kidding aside and everything. Uh, we need to definitely address these meters at some time. But the amplifier is performing very well. I ran it all day. I listened to a whole bunch of different music on it. And it sounds terrific. And I couldn't be happier with the way it turned out. Uh, this amp's probably going to go up for sale. I think my friend's going to sell it. And whoever gets it is going to get a really good amplifier. I think this thing should last many, many years. This pales in comparison to the project that will be coming up next. <laughs> and I'm really excited to get on it. And uh, hope you will be too. But uh, hope we had some fun in this video a little bit. And 
We'll be back again real soon, I'm sure. But until then, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll see you again real soon. Thanks a lot for coming along with me on another journey. Take care. Bye-bye.